Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Jonathan Friedman, and this is The Common Room, PEN America's weekly conversation series about free speech, diversity, and inclusion in higher education. PEN America's mission is to celebrate creative expression and defend the civil liberties that make it possible, and I invite all of you in attendance today to consider joining us in our national membership of writers, journalists, scholars, and their allies in support of our mission. Today, we'll be tackling what I think is a serious issue in higher education that has been simmering for many years, but kind of heating up, uh, I think, it, during the Trump administration, the issue of free speech, academic freedom, and adjunct faculty. I'm delighted to be joined here in conversation today by Jorg Tide, the Director of Research at the American Association of University Professors. Thank you for having me. Nicole Monier, uh, teaching Professor of Russian in the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at the University of Missouri. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And Preston Mitchum, a Black and queer civil rights advocate, policy director of URGE, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity, and an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for all of you uh, coming. And we're also very thankful today to our co-sponsor, the American Association of University Professors. So before we get to the main topic of the hour, just a quick note on the structure. In the first portion of today's uh, session, we'll largely be focusing on conversation among the panelists. And in the second half, we'll be inviting questions from the audience. If you have a burning question uh, in the audience while we're in the first half, please feel free at any time to drop a note in the Q&A box or a chat to us, a comment in the chat box. Both are welcome and invited. All here also will be reminded before we get started, this is a forum for interaction and open dialogue. So we ask that everyone speak to one another with respect and well, remember to mute when not speaking. So to the topic of the hour, free speech, adjunct faculty and academic freedom. I thought we would start by getting the panelists general thoughts on this issue. So why is free speech and academic freedom important? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to professors? And why does it matter to adjunct non-tenured track faculty in particular? Let's start with you, York. Thank you, John. Um, I mean, of course, as a, as a general matter, um, you know, academic freedom is, is in many ways the, the lifeblood of the university uh, in that the purpose of the university is, is to, to promote the search for truth and to promote the free discussion of ideas uh, in, in the classroom. And so without the protection of academic freedom, uh, universities simply cannot cannot fulfill their core function. Um, of course, for many years, the AUP has argued that you know a level of job protection, that is protection against dismissal uh, in violation of one's academic freedom, is necessary to protect academic freedom, which has led to the uh, introduction of the concept of tenure. In U.S. higher education, but now a large number of faculty are appointed outside of the tenure stream, a vast majority of faculty, and uh, uh, it is a serious question how their academic freedom can be protected. Nicole, let's go to you next. Your thoughts on this question. So I will I will talk about this as uh, it's great to start with Jorg because he he knows AAUP the the larger policies and kind of the philosophical uh, arc that uh, explains and upholds academic freedom in this country in the in the classroom and in in labs. Um, practically speaking, you know, universities are where dangerous ideas happen, uh, and there needs to be a space to explore them. Um, knowledge is, I think we all agree, power, and, and knowledge needs to be tested, pushed to its limits. Uh, and if we do not have the pro some sort of protection to do that, to get to what we hope is something, I know it's not a, a postmodern idea, but something that resembles truth or uh, a, a workable hypothesis, um, a theory that has enormous merit or just the accumulation of you know, important knowledge. If we can't do that and be able to push it around and sometimes push it in uncomfortable directions, then uh, the end product, whether it's in our teaching or in our research and scholarship, is going to be less than uh, it should be. Mm. 
So research, scholarship. Let's go to you, Preston, on this topic, because I think you also have a life, not only as an adjunct professor, but as a public intellectual. How do you think about the issues around academic freedom? I appreciate this question a lot because oftentimes I think about what's required of professors, even adjuncts to do from many people's opinion when we enter into the classroom. And the idea is usually that you strip yourself of who you are for the sake of academic integrity. And I think it really depends on whose definition of academic integrity we're following. Um, for so many marginalized communities, our voices are always stifled outside of the classroom. And then to double that down inside of the classroom is something that we know all too well. I um, mean, so I think about a lot of the work that I do outside of the classroom when it comes to abortion access and comprehensive sexuality education and sex work decriminalization, among other things, which are usually viewed as more leftist, uh, more liberal, um, and things that are actually counter to conservative values and principles. I've also received a lot of death threats and hate mails as a result of a lot of those um, efforts and conversations as well. And so for me, when I think about what it means to actually have academic freedom and free speech in the classroom, it is to be able to take the who I am and the research that I've done in the outside and translate that into the inside. Um, and I think that if we don't do that, if we don't stick to academic freedom, if we don't stick to free speech, then we're gonna continue to stifle marginalized communities who are already siloed out and stifled um, in the academic classroom anyway, right? When we think about the, the race behind the, the number of professors, right? Who's a professor of color? When you think about professors who are of color and also LGBTQ, uh, right? So it's a litany of reasons why, but I think about as a marginalized person, when I'm thinking about black indigenous and other people of color, and how we're often stifled outside of the classroom. I think about just how dangerous and problematic it would be to actually replicate those same behaviors inside of the classroom. And we've seen this as a major challenge. I mean, major challenge with regard to social media, with regard to um, folks who are publishing pieces in you know, mainstream news. You know, York, what's your sense of, I don't know, the heat around these issues of academic freedom today, particularly in the past few years? So let me maybe add first, uh, um, um, just to expand on, on, on sort of the, the, the question of academic freedom. Um, and its definition, the AUP has since its founding included the kinds of things that Preston just man mentioned, uh, activities outside of the classroom, being a public intellectual, uh, participating in online discussions or, or on social media. I mean, it, it, the AUP has, has always included what it calls extramural speech as part of its definition of academic freedom which is, is, is interesting because as far as I know, the United States uh, uh, are the only country who define academic freedom in this particular way. Uh, 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 in other countries, to the best of my knowledge, it is really restricted to speech uh, that is directly related to one's professional function as a, a, in the classroom or, or, or as a researcher. But because of some specific historical developments that, that, that were going on during the time that the AUP was founded, um, extramural speech has become a part of the definition of academic freedom in the United States. And frankly, if you look at um, the sort of history of cases that the AUP has taken up in the last hundred years, um, cases that involve dismissing faculty members because of their engagement outside of the classroom um, make up a very large part of those cases. Um, um, you know, whether it's the case of Stephen Salida, uh, at the University of Illinois, which is a more recent case, uh, um, and, 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 and a large number of cases uh, um, you know, during its entire history. So um, I do think that, so get, to get back to your question, John, um, that in the last four years or so, uh, certainly with um, um, following the 2016 election, um, we have seen um, a real uptick of activity of, um, um, you know, uh, highlighting speech by professors, by, by organizations that, that exist for the purpose of, of, you know, pointing out what they view as departures from some kind of perceived political orthodoxy. Uh, and, 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 you know, these kinds of activities lead to the kinds of things that Preston was just describing of, of hate mail, uh, death threats being directed at faculty members. And that is something that, that 
we have been quite concerned about over the course of the last four years uh, and, and that we see as a very serious uh, threat to academic freedom. Do you think it's been worse for adjunct professors then, you know, the, these dynamics? Well, what I can say certainly is, is that, you know, the cases that we've seen in the last four years uh, where, you know, a faculty member either posted something on Twitter or, or um, you know, made some other comment of a political nature um, um, that has led them to be identified in one of these uh, right-wing news outlets and, 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 and subjected them to these kinds of attacks. The cases in which people actually lost their jobs, to the best of my knowledge, were universally people off the tenure track. Um, um, you know, there, there are no cases of dismissals of, of tenured professors for these cases that I'm aware of, or even uh, um, perhaps of some tenure track professors, but, but it can, if it comes to tenure, if it comes really to cases of, of these dismissals since 2016, they have been, uh, you know, the, the cases that I'm aware of where people were dismissed, they were primarily um, off the tenure track. Right, so it's play, played a big role um, in, in kind of what I would think of as like the repercussions for when you're called out for speech or, or where you've said something that has um, offended a group uh, and, and the ways in which those groups have been calling on universities to discipline professors. I think this question though, I mean, Nicole, you have been a long-term non-tenure track faculty member. I'm sure in your long career, uh, you've had this a kind of sense of what that means, right? To be a professor who maybe doesn't enjoy the same status or maybe doesn't enjoy the same privileges as you know tenure track professors. How does that manifest for you around the issues of free speech and academic freedom or, or does it? So that's an interesting question. Um, I have been kind of a big mouth and a, a, a terrier. So uh, and for many, many years here, I, I felt secure in my job and I, I was active on faculty council and active in getting NTT voting rights on campus and involved in other issues. For me, the turning point came in 2017 when we started seeing significant layoffs and for um, NTT and adjunct faculty non-renewals as a response to those, um, to those budget constraints. And that's, that was really on my own skin the first time I felt more concerned about uh, the interplay between my you know, kind of presence on campus as an advocate for NTT and um, what that could potentially mean uh, for the longevity of my position. Um, it, it, that, and I also think there's some privileging, like we talk about contingent faculty as if they're all the same flavor um, and they're not, right? So I'm a contract NTT ranked, I can go for promotion. Um, longevity doesn't guarantee anything, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, and that is very different from long-term adjunct instructors or part-time adjunct instructors or new adjunct instructors. So um, there are hierarchies within that, there are hierarchies within these structures of contingent faculty that play out differently on different campuses. And so uh, all of that said, um, the combination of the political climate in the past four years combined with especially at uh, public and universities and, and many private smaller ones as well, um, the financial uh, crisis that has feels like it's systemic at this point has uh, undoubtedly had an effect on uh, our ability, our sense that we can speak out in the same ways that maybe we were more comfortable with doing beforehand. Um, and, and that might be the most immediate thing for a lot of adjunct faculty is not the larger po political climate, but uh, when you do budget, serious budget cuts, it's some, you're only cutting people at some point and you can't cut tenure tracks, so, or you can't certainly cut tenure, so that, that financial pressure um, and vulnerability, I think, has increased uh, for us. And so I think there's a fairly uh, commonplace self-censorship 
that I'm also a Russian professor, right? So I have to talk about, you know, self-criticism and self-censorship. Um, and so um, I, I believe that, and I know from talking to some of my fellow um, adjunct NTT faculty friends um, here and elsewhere, that that is a constraint that we wear and uh, gives us pause when we uh, say things that might be upsetting. So same, same question, I mean, to you, Preston, do you, do you have the same experience of this thinking about what to say or what not to say through the lens of your uh, uh, appointment at Georgetown or, or it's somewhat peripheral to the activism and, and intellectual activity that you're engaged in? Uh, directly linked. So I oftentimes, I, so let me say, even before I became an adjunct professor, um, I was very used to public criticism. Um, so me receiving any kind of um, hostile tweets or mailings, among other things, wasn't a shock um, because I, because I was an activist, I still am, and um, was used to organizing and marching in the streets and being very vocal against white supremacy and um, you know systemic he hegemony and you know trans antagonism and queer phobia, et cetera. So, you know, and, and, and that is who I will always be, right? Adjunct professor or, or not. Um, and I knew, and these were frankly part of the conversations that I had even, even vying for positions. Um, and so to me, it became very directly linked to that who I am, the work that I do, the way that I lawyer is directly linked to my grassroots organizing and activism and is the, and is the very way I actually instruct the classroom. And so, you know, thankfully my classes, I usually teach, um, I used to teach advanced legal research and writing. Now I tend to teach LGBTQ health law and policy. So you usually are a little bit more uh, shock, le or less shocked, I should say, when you come into my classroom and I discuss many of these things because you likely have an interest in LGBTQ politics and policy um, and particularly the health outcomes of LGBTQ people. Um, but I think those things are directly, directly linked. And so um, I think, though I wasn't shocked by maybe any of the death threats, it doesn't make it easy. And it certainly didn't make it pleasing. And they certainly increased. And I think I just had to be really mindful and intentional about the panels that I was on, um, the, the interviews I would do, um, among other things. And that especially came to head when I went on the Lauren Ingram show about three or four times um, on Fox News. And it really increased after that. I will say the way Georgetown has always responded um, to me, I'm thankful. It's been very protective and very safe. Um, you know, to the point I can I'll publicly share that you know when I received a, a, a many many uh, hate tweets and death threats, um, you know I received a phone call um, from campus and it was essentially to ask me if I wanted to be escorted to class. So when I saw the phone ring, I thought I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get fired, <laughs> right? And none of that came up. It was, hey, we're really worried because we saw some things and we received some calls um, threatening you. Do, do you want to be escorted to class? And that was it. And so though I know um, that's probably, maybe I shouldn't say rare, but in my experience talking to some other adjuncts, it was quite rare. Um, I also, you know, understand that, um, and this could be a good or a bad thing, but I know I'm audacious enough to, to, to understand that what I care about more than anything is my ability to have speech, right? Like I, I'm not, I, I will take that over, an, over employment any day, to be completely honest. And, and, and I say that honestly, as a black queer person and as someone who, who understands what it is like to always be stifled and to, to live under the threat of white supremacy that teaches us to be scared to make our statements public and bold. Um, and I already knew because I have like a, a decent following on social media that these were some of the consequences that could happen. Again, it doesn't make it easier, um, but I'm very clear about what that actually means. But I know I cannot separate my activism, my organizing, and me being a lawyer from the way I instruct the classroom. Um, that it's just impossible for me to do. You and know, and I think to say ahead. that differently, it's probably possible for me to do. It's just something I refuse to do. No, and I, I think that's admirable, really. And uh, as is the response you're referencing from Georgetown, we did a program in our series here a few weeks ago talking about faculty harassment. And there are clear and obvious inconsistencies, you know, between how, you know, whether it's your dean or department chair or university leaders are taking and tackling 
in responding to these situations where faculty get harassed. Um, and you know, my sense of it is that even if this just hasn't been your case, around the country there are, you know, calculations that go on in 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 as part of just the general way in which the the contingent faculty are generally viewed as somewhat secondary. You know, and I think. It, you know, certainly speaking, as I, I used to adjunct, I never really felt like I was truly a member of the faculty. In my case, I only did it for a few years, so um, uh, maybe it was you know not the same kind of established uh, career experience that some of you were talking about. But certainly, I, I always had the sense that there were like the professors at the university, and then I, I also worked there. But I, I wouldn't even have presumed to think that the university would necessarily uphold my academic freedom in the ways that it might do for others. You know, no one had ever taught that to me that I should demand it or expect it. Um, it was not even something I thought much about it in those days. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that's uncommon, uh, particularly for people who are, you know, emerging out of their PhDs and then now spending increasing numbers of years uh, on the tenure track, well, circuit, let's call it. Um, I wonder John, that, you know, yeah. Sorry, just to jump in for a second and and just to to maybe add to this that, I mean, we certainly have seen only a few instances, uh, at least where, where it was reported to us, that administrations have acted as admirably as, as Georgetown's did in, in Preston's case. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that is that I think is interesting here is that, especially when these cases happen at public universities in states that have uh, uh, you know, a Republican majority in, in the legislature, um, I think there are pressures there in particular on those institutions that some private universities don't experience as, as urgently. Um, and, but I do think that that is a very serious concern if, if we end up um, having, and I'm, again, this is not universal. There certainly are also private universities that at times uh, sacrifice uh, academic freedom uh, um, because of other external pressures. But I think one of the things that we have seen in particular in the last several years, several of our investigations that, that related to instances like this, they were at public universities in, in states where you know, a majority Republican legislature, uh, either overtly or, or you know, you know, it was reasonable to, to infer, uh, was, was, was pressuring the institution to act in a particular way to, to solve this problem. And I think that that raises some very important questions about academic freedom um, uh, in this country at this time. Yeah, I, well, I think that the public intellectual social media side of it is one. Another is research and a third is probably academic teaching. So just focusing on that third one for a minute, you know, I'm not sure if either of you, Preston, Nicole, have personal experiences where you can say there was a time when I thought about teaching that the way I historically had and then I changed it for an audience. But maybe do you know of peers who are thinking these, you know, having these thoughts, having these concerns? Uh, certainly, I think there's also a dimension to this, which is um, brought on by COVID and teaching virtually, where it's a lot even easier for someone to be recording what you're teaching in class. So are, are folks being more mindful about how they're talking about things in the classroom if they're adjuncts in terms of their free speech, or you think, no, that's not much of an issue? I mean, I, I definitely think it's an issue and not just to be absolutely fair, not just for adjuncts. I think it's for all faculty in the classroom and especially those in fields uh, that have uh, kind of inherently a social justice uh, flavor to them. Um, I, again, uh, for I, I, you know, I've had conversations with some colleagues. They're absolutely aware of it. They they know that in stepping into the classroom and talking about critical race theory or uh, queer identities. Um, or, or even teaching something like um, social inequalities, in a, which is a pretty typical sociology course, that they are already, in a sense, open um, to pushback even before they step into the classroom. Uh, it, have I heard of instructors who have not um, done what they would have done otherwise? No, but I have zero doubt <laughs> that 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 is happening. That's part of kind of the self-censorship um, because your contract to contract 
Um, you depend on student reviews. Um, you depend on the financial health of your department. All of these things are very powerful pressures for, for, for being careful. Although I will also say uh, that when we do go into the classroom and, and teach issues that touch on these kind of uh, social justice uh, questions, it is our responsibility to be, um, to be not to be careful, but to be conscientious and making sure that there is a space in the classroom for all of the viewpoints. I mean, that's one of the things that I think academic freedom is supposed to model is how do you have difficult dialogues around unresolved um, and sensitive issues? How do you talk through the implications of knowledge and theory uh, in a way that is robust and, and engaging and um, equitable. And equity isn't, I mean, sometimes we talk about equity if it's, as if it's only for the people who don't have equal status, but equity is for everyone, whether you're majority or minority, um, privileged, less privileged. Uh, so I will stop there. I could go on, but this is a great conversation, by the way. I just wanted to do my jazz hands. <laughs> yeah, and I don't I don't think I have any actually anything else to add. I mean, I completely agree that especially with the idea of um, what people have done it differently, I don't think that they would have, but it's certainly something to think about. I mean, I think about all the time, like when I'm changing curricula or when I'm changing um, the syllabus, how to say something differently, but it but it just isn't genuine. And not only is it genuine, sometimes it's just actually not accurate anymore. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the balance that that a lot of adjuncts are playing with is, you know, how do we say the thing? Maybe that seems less controversial, but realizing that the alternatives are still just as, like would still be taken just as controversially. And so um, I think after a while we recognize that it's not really about how we say something or the reframing of it. People just have a fundamental disagreement. And so the question then becomes, how do you actually change language if there's a fundamental disagreement? If, if what people are actually trying to do is silence, um, that's different than saying, how do we actually have this conversation in a way that balances approaches and voices? Um, because even in my classroom, if students happen to disagree with me on particular things, if I'm explaining sex work um, and how that ties into law and policy and students disagree or at least want to offer their disagreement, it's an open discussion to offer that disagreement. So I think I, I think oftentimes it gets looked at as like, you know, um, at least as the way it was couched to me, it's like, oh, the classroom is a setting where liberals just want to spread their liberal agenda. But the truth of the matter is, it's like everyone still has the, the, the right to speak should they feel comfortable with doing. So I think the question then becomes, how are we making the classroom comfortable that everyone can share their perspectives uh, without feeling like they're going to be challenged or not challenged, we should challenge, but feeling like they're going to be penalized for offering a, a different perspective. I mean, certainly that's something that we've seen a lot in the news, this this kind of concept of liberal indoctrination and this notion that students, you know, don't feel comfortable, certainly if they're more conservative in more liberal higher education spaces in speaking, I don't know, openly about their views on any kind of on a range of topics. Um, and, and so, you know, one thought is, is the extent to which there is an onus on professors to make explicit that space for disagreement, for dialogue, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, just thinking about this, this question around like teaching and adjuncts and, you know, you know, Nicole, what you were talking about a minute ago with regard to the precarity. I mean, I also think of that in conjunction with the just extreme explosion of the adjunct teaching force as a percentage of who is doing the teaching on colleges and university at campuses, uh, or I should say now I'm thinking now they're doing it online, but there are more people who are professors who are in this more precarious position and you know, is I know no one's the inevitable impact into inquiry or academic freedom or free speech, but one does start to worry about it in, in, in terms of thinking about you know the direction of, of the academy overall. I'm just curious, Jorg, from you know the AAUP's perspective, has there been an uptick in you know measurable indications of those dynamics? Uh, do you see more adjuncts who are in you know more I don't know hot water? Um, I mean, we've certainly seen more, you know, public cases. I mean, there certainly ha are always uh, faculty of, of different um, 
you know, uh, with different employment statuses who, who contact us. I mean, certainly, you know, the, the, this focus on, 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 on political speech of faculty members uh, uh, and then leading to dismissal of faculty members, we have certainly done more investigations of uh, non-tenure track contingent faculty members in, in recent years, I would say that. If I could just though, explore a little bit further one of the issues um, you know, around this question, both of political indoctrination in the classroom, but also the question sort of, 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 of um, you know, how much space for certain kinds of opinions there should be. I mean, I, I think it is also important though to recognize that some of the opinions that are sometimes claimed are stifled are entirely at odds with disciplinary standards. That is, there really is no room in a class on evolution to discuss intelligent design, and, and certainly not in the biology department, um, perhaps in, in, you know, in, in the religion department. Um, there, you know, there, are, there are other kinds of disciplinary standards that I believe professors can appropriately invoke to say, these are, these are you know, I mean, a, a, a classroom is not a free for all. Um, there, are, there are both general disciplinary grounds, such as having to raise your hand before you speak, but there are also substantive uh, limitations on uh, what can reasonably be contributed. And I think it is entirely appropriate for faculty members to uh, invoke uh, standards of the academy, uh, um, standards of their particular disciplines to say, um, no, this, th there is no room for this because, because whether it's intelligent design, whether it's, you know, uh, alternative theories of, of, of climate change that are not accepted by, by, the, by the scientific community, um, I think it is appropriate for faculty members to identify them as such and to say that there is no room for this kind of thing in the class as it's conceptualized. And I think we, we need to be careful not to cater to these concerns about supposed liberal indoctrination by giving up on, on important disciplinary standards. I mean, I do appreciate that some of these questions ultimately can be contested. And in some instances where disciplinary standards may not be as, as secure as they might be, say in the case of, of evolution and biology, um, that, that, there, that there is space for disagreement about it. But, but I do want to just establish this as an important principle that, that you know, the classroom is not simply a free speech zone and, and, and can never be because it exists in the space of the university uh, and in, 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 in a disciplinary academic space um, that always places limits on, on what is acceptable within, within you know, confines that, that, that the, the academic community is involved in establishing. Can I push back a little? Uh, because uh, we're talking about undergrads, right? So we're talking about undergraduate classrooms and the idea that uh, we come in with this top-down disciplinary expectations of raising hands and you must act this way and uh, must act that way in the classroom um, is not always inclusive. And I, I am a dedicated undergraduate instructor. I love uh, undergraduate students and I should reveal that I'm also an undergraduate dean. So I have that kind of dark, <laughs> the, dark the dark hat on as well as, uh, as, as the other. Um, but part of our job in an undergraduate classroom is to explain what a discipline is. Uh, students do not know, by and large, what the discipline of sociology is or mathematics or biology. Uh, and so part of our task, and this gets back to my comment about we should be modeling what um, what discussion is. Uh, we should be modeling how to talk when some people know more than other people know, or people are coming in with one set of ideas about what X should be and what's appropriate and not, and, and another. So I think it's a little messier um, on the ground, York, than, than you're saying. There's not this kind of like, you come into the class of the Russian classroom and you will conform to the standards of the discipline of Russian studies. 
Um, so I think I, I think that makes things for undergraduate teaching, especially a little more complicated, right? So I put that out there. Not that fundamentally, yes, it's not supposed to be a free for all, but I think any undergraduate instructor has had that moment where it has been. But part of what we're trying to do is, is shape an understanding of discipline. Um, and so at some point we have to engage questions like why might intelligent design not be appropriate for um, a, a classroom on a class on evolution. Preston, you were talking a minute ago uh, about, you know, limits on speech, you know, for who, you know, occupies your social location, your experience, um, your position in, in the U.S., you know, thinking about the power of speech, the importance of free speech, and, and the idea that, you know, we really have to be very cautious, I think, about how we limit it. This has been a major controversy, you know, major issue around the country with many professors now coming under fire for things they put on social media. Sometimes it's, you know, a clip of something they said in class. Sometimes it's taken out of context. I do like asking people this question to get, you know, just a range of responses. But like when you reflect on the issue of just free speech or academic freedom itself, like, do you think of it as York was saying on it, that there are kind of some reasonable limits that we should have on campuses that we can have on professors or, you know, you know, one of the concerns I often think about is whenever we're talking about reasonable limits, is who's deciding what those limits should be? So the challenging question. Um, and frankly, I think sometimes it's who, who, who's the messenger. Um, like I, I actually do not, actually cannot imagine a time where we have like one rule that would apply to everyone equally. I imagine if you created a rule that said something to the effect of no language, no one should use language that discriminates against one community against a community right i am positive that when you think of like many professors of color and many women and many lgbtq people if they make comments that could be construed as actually making a discriminatory remark depending on how we view discrimination how we define it i think you will see that who's ultimately harmed are the communities who we're proclaiming to protect and so I think, I think it's a challenging question because when I look back at some of the statements that I made that essentially made people frustrated, I wouldn't take any of them back. I think they're factual based on, I think they're historical. I think they're data-driven. Um, not I think, they are factual. They are data-driven and they are historical. Um, I think there are just things that people didn't agree with and or didn't like. Um, like if I say, if I make a comment that like white supremacy is valid or violent, excuse me, and you say, I'm not a white supremacist, and then you're upset and send it to like a dean somewhere. It's like, well, I'm not really understanding what you're wanting me to push back on because what I said was a factual statement, white supremacy is violent. And, you know, so I know though, if we're thinking about creating these rules, ultimately, like who would ultimately be impacted, I deeply believe would be um, most, most, and I say marginalized professors, meaning like the general identities of those professors. Um, would be more more often than not the ones who are up to be terminated first or to be you know under fire first. Um, so it was it reminds me of one time I can't think of this professor's name unfortunately, but um, she went on Fox News and it was a comment being made around Black Lives Matter. Um, and you know her comment from some for some were perceived as really snarky. I mean frankly I think that was her point like she was trying to be. And the way some of the, the the comments went were almost like she was the 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 violent person, the harm doer. Um, when ultimately, I deeply agreed with her statement. Um, and I think like you know, and I think that, and, and I and I can't disconnect her race or her gender from any of that. Um, and so like I'm pretty sure that like again, if we created those rules, they would just apply to her differently than it would like you know, some of her counterparts. Um, so I think it's just really challenging. I think that's, I think it's a great question. I just think we can't disassociate and disconnect like intersectional frames and identities from that. Um, because no matter how progressive an institution is, we unfortunately still see the people who are ultimately impacted look like me or communities of color broadly. Or do you wanna come in on this question of limits? Limits on what people can say on professors? Should there be any? Sure. I mean, and just to br briefly, just to reference what Nicole was saying, I don't, I don't think we're, we're really necessarily in, in disagreement. I think sort of specifying why certain kinds of disciplinary limits exist. I mean, certainly, ultimately, it's not a matter of penalizing students, but to educate them 
uh, about these principles, but but I think I, I was mostly trying to to uh, I guess uh, to 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 deal with the concern that 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 faculty are accused of indoctrination because the because the classroom should be a free speech zone and simply to say I don't think that it really should be. Um, but that there actually are are limits that are that are reasonable. But I, I totally agree with Nicole that it should be an educational process of of an, of, of informing students of them and not a punitive uh, uh, um, um, exercise in 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 at, at all. Um, I mean, in terms of limits, um, I mean, as they apply to faculty members, I mean, the AUP recognizes a number of different types of limitations on academic freedom. I mean, you know, and and you I mean it would it would take too long to enumerate them all, but certainly, you know, in 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 the classroom, for instance, there are disciplinary limitations on academic freedom. I mean, some of them are sort of, um, um, I mean, so obvious that if you teach a course that is advertised as a course on uh, um, Russian literature, that you're not going to have a class on on you know, some other topic uh, that is totally unrelated to it. I mean, that's that's a limitation, but it's also one that's also entirely understood by by most everybody. Although, you know, occasionally people will come to us and ask uh, whether they can just teach whatever they want in their classroom. And our answer is no, I mean, not, not in an unlimited kind of fashion. Um, I mean, when it comes to extramural speech, so speech on, uh, 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 you know, Twitter and other kinds of things, I mean, I, you know, I think historically the AUP's position has been um, that uh, extramural speech should really only be taken into consideration on the campus if it somehow uh, reflects on the professional fitness of the faculty member in in some capacity. Um, and so, you know, I think there are there are many sort of thought experiments about exactly what what that means. But but certainly, uh, you know, somebody on 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 Twitter. Um, you know, demonstrating that they are actually uh, uh, incompetent uh, in their discipline certainly can be used to raise questions about their professional comp competence on their campus, and that is, in some sense, a limitation then on on their on their academic freedom. And there are again, there are other there's sort of a whole a host of of, of recognized um, um, limitations, but that those are certainly ones that I think are are well understood. I, I want to push back on you just a little bit to clarify, because, you know, to me, even some of that language, right, anytime we try to put these, I don't know, um, um, contingencies, you know, like professional fitness to serve as a professor, you know, it often comes down to who's making that determination. And I have been, you know, hearing about all of these cases at universities in the past few years, colleges, universities, where sometimes the people making those judgments you know, may not, you know, be making them the same way they would be made somewhere else. So for example, a professor who is is looked at because of their tweets and their extramural speech as being uncivil to elected officials or a professor who uh, was an adjunct saying, you know, they were being disrespectful of law enforcement and things that they were saying online and therefore that brought into question their ability to teach. So I think, you know, even in that circumstance, I I'm curious to hear from you, you know, is it perfect? Is it is it just as likely to be, I don't know, politicized and, and what Preston was talking a minute ago, used against historically marginalized communities um, uh, to kind of attack their quote unquote fitness to teach? Sure. I mean, I should say first that, I mean, the, the sort of the absolute bedrock fundamental concept of the AUP here is, is that that determination should be made by one's professional peers. I mean, that should not be a determination made by by administrators, but in fact, uh, um, be subject to a hearing uh, in front of a hearing committee in which faculty members assess to what extent um, um, the professional fitness here is implicated. Is that process perfect? Um, no, probably not. I mean, you know, I don't know that there is a, a, a perfect process, um, but I mean, I do think ultimately that um, there are instances in which um, extramural speech or, or in classroom speech um, fall outside of the realm of what, what 
academic freedom as, as the AUP understands as protects and there needs to be a mechanism for addressing it. Uh, I mean, otherwise, um, you know, it, 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 it essentially would mean that there, there really are no limits. I mean, if you can't enforce them, then, then there are no limits. And, and the only appropriate way that we can think of that, that um, brings in the professional expertise um, of one's peers is, is through this kind of a process. Um, but certainly, um, there, are, there I'm sure there are examples of cases where, um, you know, uh, faculty bodies did not make the right call. Um, but I think it still is, is, is the main way by which we would want to see that adjudicated. John, may I jump in? So I think I think this is fascinating because I think, and sorry, and I'm also kind of commenting on um, something I see in the open forum um, around what I'm attempting to name, and it's really the tension of what it means to be fair and, and open, and if that means being objective and impartial. And I often think that people believe you can divorce that from who's actually entering into the classroom via the being the professor, and I don't think that that's true. And so I think that when you have a professor who an adjunct or even a tenure track for that matter, but more and more like more than likely an adjunct who's walking into the classroom, who's making statements that could be construed as hostile. And I want to be very clear, like Black Lives Matter, for example, like um, we see so much tension, like virtually and in person for the past five to seven years. And, you know, to the point I was making earlier about the, the, the Black woman who I believe was actually terminated. Um, like there was a huge call for her termination. And for me, like when, what I meant was like not being able to divorce um, her race and gender from her statement. And, you know, for me, I just can't even imagine the reason why her peers would have actually believed that her statements were hostile or harmful outside of her just speaking around Black Lives Matter and her being a, a Black woman. And, you know, so when you're leaving these things to peers in an environment that's not terribly diverse, that's actually still a little hegemonic, frankly, when it comes to race um, and depending on the, the location, so the region of the place, among other things, and how much tension or backlash you're receiving or emails you're receiving as like a dean or someone who's an administrator, I think you'll have these time and like you'll have these results time and again, and they will continually impact by and large historically marginalized communities. And again, the same communities that most of us including those who are academics would say that we're attempting to protect. And it's because we are attempting to have this one size fits all model, but that can apply. And I think that part of my tension is sitting with, I think when people hear about things being fair and open, they're thinking of equality. And one of the reasons why I always talk about equity over equality is because if you're all just saying like everything is the same playing field, then we can't do that. Like we actually, we actually harm marginalized communities if all we're worried about is equality. The only way to actually really dig deep and actually talk about what it means to be a person of color and if you're protecting people of color and other marginalized communities is by recognizing that naturally the systems are designed against those communities. And so the way that you actually promote fairness and promote inclusion and promote actual fairness and openness is to recognize that what they say and what we say is naturally going to be taken as more hostile, unfortunately. And so then you actually have to go into a different result and a different investigation and a different model. Because if we're applying it all equally, then time and again, those will be the same communities who are harmed in the, in the academic space. I want to invite anybody in the audience to submit any questions in the Q&A box as we're looking at the time. Um, uh, all questions would be welcome here. Um, but just, you know, what your comments made me think of, because um, we're really talking in part about free speech and, and power here uh, and, and historical power and hege hegemony and patriarchy, whatever it is. Um, you know, thinking about also how we started this conversation, thinking about the power differentials between the, you know, tenure track professors and the non tenure track adjuncts, you know, Nicole, in your experience, when we're talking about faculty governance or fac even faculty bodies that might be, I don't know, evaluating, you know, extramural speech or speech by an adjunct professor in the classroom, are those bodies often composed of other adjuncts so just you know taking away the identity politics of it for a minute to just think in terms of the status politics of the university is that a major issue that people are paying attention to or or or, or know much about um, it is a great point and it goes back to my comment that not all contingent faculty are equal 
Uh, so at Mizzou, if you were a ranked NTT faculty member, such as myself, uh, it, and and a and you were sent you know, sent up to the faculty or responsibility uh, process. The chances that there might be an NTT on that committee are good. Um, the chances, if you're an adjunct, a, a true adjunct, semester to semester with no title beyond instructor, and you got sent. I, I don't. I don't even know that you qualify to go in front of that body. Frankly, um, I. I would have to go back and look at our CRRs, uh, whether adjuncts could uh, be put through that uh, that position. Uh, but that the the faculty or responsibility process assumes that you have an ongoing position, right? Because you're 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 kind of being judged in the context of that. And if one of the consequences is that you could lose your position especially if you're tenure tracked, but, but even if you're an NTT with a contract, you would have to go through that process to terminate the position. If you're an adjunct, you just don't hire the person back. Uh, so the short answer is no, um, adjuncts are not gonna be in the spaces where they're being um, evaluated by so-called faculty peers uh, to adjudicate an issue uh, of faculty or responsibility. Jonathan, just to, to jump in too, uh, I mean, and I think certainly acknowledging Preston's point about, um, um, you know, concerns that may exist with disciplinary processes and, and who, who might be involved in, in, in hearing them, the cases that we've seen of part-time faculty member, including the faculty member Preston referenced, um, those simply went outside of any disciplinary pr processes at all. I mean, these were simply, and in the case of, I mean, I think this is really where the point gets back to the, the subject of, of our conversation here, is, is that there really are these important differences that in many cases, they, there aren't any um, policies, as, as Nicole just mentioned, to adjudicate uh, uh, cases of part-time faculty members. Uh, and, and even beyond, not rehiring them, uh, as Nicole already mentioned, many of the cases that we ended up investigating in recent years were cases where the administration simply placed the uh, part-time faculty member on leave through the end of the current term and then didn't rehire them and said, well, we paid them through the end of the term. And so it's just um, an, an, a case of not rehiring them. But from our perspective, that is a dismissal. If you take somebody out of the classroom, even if you continue paying them uh, uh, and then not rehire them, from our perspective, that is just a summary dismissal. I was thinking also, we didn't talk about it much, but the disciplinary framing of academic freedom in terms of who adjudicates these things, you know, is also an interesting point of reflection in terms of you know, interdisciplinarity as a pushback against rigid borders as a kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say necessarily um, uh, revolutionary change, but certainly when I think about some of the most dynamic or interesting or new ways of thinking about topics, sometimes those might percolate up not through um, disciplinary, you know, universes, but some, but sometimes, you know, people at their interstices who tend to be people who also often are the ones who ends up adjuncting um, because it's harder to get positions in, you know, departments with dis you know, disciplinary and, and more rigidly defined lines. So that's a really interesting dynamic in terms of we think about, you know, the policing of thought and the, the ways in which the whole system, uh, the, the kind of system as a whole is set up to allow, um, I don't know, more radical or, or more dissenting points of view uh, in general. I wanted to just end by asking each of you a final question here, um, you know, reflecting on solutions to these challenges, you know, are actions in your mind now necessary to confront some of these challenges around free speech and adjunct faculty um, by tenured professors uh, on behalf of their non tenure track colleagues or are actions more necessary by university leaders um, are the things that the AUP or other organized bodies are thinking of, you know, when you think about just the situation and reflecting on it holistically. What do you think needs to change or what do you think needs to be done? And, and we'll kind of start with you, York. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the first, you know, that, that I think uh, 
um, we already sort of touched on is just this issue of faculty participation and governance. Um, I mean, if we don't um, um, encourage the participation or in some cases even, you know, allow for the participation uh, of um, uh, um, non-tenure track faculty, part-time faculty in governance, um, um, I don't see how um, there is going to be a possibility for, for advocating for their rights. And I think that includes, you know, also, uh, also just thinking about, um, um, you know, encouraging um, members of underrepresented groups to participate in governance who often, who often do not, uh, uh, um, um, you know, who are not ad adequately represented in, in these bodies. Um, Beyond that, I think I think another thing that 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 is a more longer term um, uh, undertaking is really to spend some time thinking about the purpose of the institution of tenure uh, and 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 what it has come to represent at this point. Um, when when tenure is really viewed as this sort of merit badge, uh, purely tied to research accomplishments. Um, and, and the view is that those who don't have those kinds of accomplishments don't need the protections of tenure. I think we have moved entirely away from the way that certainly the sort of foundational documents of the AUP think about tenure. I mean, from our perspective, certainly somebody in Nicole's position who has taught full time for well over seven years should simply have the protections of tenure by virtue of having been at the institution for that length of time. Um, and it should not be tied uh, um, to some specific expectations of, of research accomplishments and somehow to, to, to think that um, uh, faculty members who hold teaching positions somehow do not need the protections of tenure. Um, the, the, the purpose of, of the tenures, you know, the, the institution of tenure, how it was conceptualized by the AUP was to protect academic freedom. And if a large percentage of the faculty are simply excluded from that, it, it can't serve that purpose. Nicole. Sorry, struggling with the mute button there for a moment. Uh, first of all, I want to make a correction because I just checked our CRRs and instructors are covered. Um, anybody who has an instructor title is covered by our faculty irresponsibility process. Um, but I think the point about the likelihood of a, a, of a fellow adjunct being uh, involved in the process um, stance. So yay, Missouri, that we include instructors in that process. So shout out. Um, so my, my, my answer is, um, goes back to an anecdote many, many years ago when I started working on NTT issues, I spoke with our then uh, deputy provost, great guy, and said, hey, Ken, do, do I have academic freedom? And he looked at me and said, yes, you absolutely do have academic freedom. And then he paused and he said, but you have a short-term contract. And that's all he said. So that kind of brings us back to um, York's point is that there has to be a way to better protect uh, our academic freedom than a, a, a two year contract can do. I might have some issues with tenure, but that's a discussion for another time. But certainly there needs to be some teeth to that notion that we are indeed covered by academic freedom given the precarity of our, our contracts. I, I like that teeth. All right, last comment, Preston. What needs to change? What, what do we do? Gosh, what does it need to change? Um, so, <laughs> so I I want to just first by giving so much appreciation to AAUP and those really in the space who I know are fighting really hard for professors to have academic freedom um, every single day. Um, I also really just look at this from a racial justice lens and a lens around like what is how do you actually protect how do you actually protect marginalized communities broadly um, and I think that we that can, again I said this before and I don't want to be a parrot but I don't think that can be disconnected from professors uh, in the academic space I have many friends who are e either NTT or or, or not 
and who are who are black and have the same complaints every single day around the around um, the academy and it's always central on how stifled many of them feel in the classroom when it comes to talking about issue areas that really matter to us personally and professionally and most of it centers on racial justice and gender justice and queer and trans justice and for me until we can actually hone in on that like actually honing in on racial justice and what it means to teach equity and how to protect folks and unionizing among other things. Um, I think we're gonna be having these conversations for years to come. And so what I think really needs to happen is us to reframe this as a racial justice conversation, regardless of who's directing it. And I think that that's really a way to get to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that's when we'll see like the, the academy being a lot better and a lot stronger. All right, well, we'll make that our final point. I wanna take a minute here to thank our panelists today, York Tita, Nicole Monier, and Preston Mitchum. Thank you all for being here with us. And to those in our audience, thank you for, for tuning in. We'll return with the Common Room in 2021. So have a happy end of year and end of semester for those teaching. Thanks all. <laughs>